Thank you so much for joining us for this in-person program. Um, I want to take a moment and just recognize two very special members in our audience today. Two of our beloved survivors in our community, Gabriella Karen and Henry Slucky. Thank you for coming. And thank you so much to our board members. I saw Galit Prince here, as well as our interns and staff and museum members. Um, as the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors, I personally am very passionate about preserving and stewarding the stories of history, the experiences of my own family, other survivors, and the larger community in order to educate future generations. So I'm especially thrilled to moderate today's Granddaughters of the Holocaust conversation um, with my friend, boss, and granddaughter of Holocaust survivors, our CEO, Beth Keen, and Franziska Frank, the granddaughter of a high-ranking high Nazi official, Hans Frank, um, who was held responsible for crimes against humanity at Nuremberg. Today we're gonna be talking a little bit about what we can learn from the past, whether it's our past or someone else's past, and what does it mean to come together as a community to make the world a more dignified and humane space. Our work here at Holocaust Museum LA is more critical than ever, with humanitarian and refugee crises worldwide, divi divisive social climate, and alarming rise in anti-Semitism and hate. Um, a study of, by the Center of the study of hate and extremism revealed that Los Angeles has the most hate crimes of any U.S. city this century in 2021 alone. So really our work is more crucial than ever and I think all of you being here today recognize that and understand that we need to be doing a better job to fulfill the founding survivors mission. For those of you who are new to the museum, um, just a really brief background. Holocaust Museum LA was initially founded by a group of Holocaust survivors who met here in Los Angeles in the early 1960s and wanted to create a space to not only commemorate their loved ones but to educate future generations. And I think what's really critical or crucial about this is that this was at a time when a lot of people weren't necessarily talking about the Holocaust. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about, I have some questions for our panelists about what was life like growing up both in the US and in Europe. But just for some background, the 1960s, the Eichmann trial had just taken place in Israel. Really talking about the Holocaust in the US was not part of the, the social conscience. And so for these survivors in the 60s to say, this happened and we need to do something so that other people learn from this is really a visionary moment in history. The work of, of course, this space is not from the 1960s. We rented space in a few different locations and were able to open our permanent home here in Pan Pacific Park in 2010. And since then, we've reached hundreds of thousands of visitors. Um, just last school year al alone, we had 30,000 students who came here on field trips to learn from our collection of primary source material, but to also to learn from the wisdom of the people who experienced and witnessed the Holocaust and really passing the torch of important conversations and lessons. Um, and a really sort of exciting next chapter for us is we will be expanding here in the park. And we, um, as part of our launch of our Building Truth campaign, we are hoping to double our footprint and really continue to create spaces where people can have continuous conversations about the important lessons of the Holocaust. It will allow us to keep survivor stories alive, ampl amplify our reach and impact, and increase our visibility. Um, and we bring programs like today's um, Granddaughters of the, of the Holocaust at no charge because for us it's really important to have free Holocaust education for those who are interested in learning about it. So if you are enjoying our programs, if you're finding them meaningful, if you've been watching on Zoom or if you've been coming in person, we invite you to continue to support our work by sharing it with your friends and family, um, by considering to make a donation to the museum or becoming a member of the museum so you can learn about programs ahead of time. Um, so it's really, really lovely to have all of you here. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce the Consul General of Germany in Los Angeles, Stefan Schneider, who will give a few remarks before we begin our panel. Thank you very much, Hilary. Thank you so much. I'm really thrilled that so many people came to, to listen to the two granddaughters. And uh, I just uh, was very thrilled when I was asked to, to be a part of it. To me, the Holocaust Museum is very, very important. You, will, you know, some of you know that. I will tell you a little bit about it. But I am not at the center of interest of these wonderful ladies who will really go into, back to history and telling us very many things. I'm very looking much forward to it. 
When I was 20 years old, uh, I was I left for Paris to study literature at the Sorbonne University, and I lived in the apartment of a French lady uh, who would rent some rooms to students. And the very first evening, I arrived there from Cologne, and she would ask me, uh, "Do you have Nazis in your family?" And I was 20 years old, and I knew there are no Nazis in my family. And she said, "How do you know?" And then I said, I'm the grandson of a, of a Holocaust survivor. And, that was, and then she said something which is still shocked my mother. She would say, otherwise I would have thrown you out. This is something which is still with me. And I said, well, um, I cannot. I'm born afterwards. These wonderful ladies are born afterwards. And I just talked, talked to uh, Mrs. Frank just a little a bit before we start. And uh, we are both. We are born afterwards, after all this, but when it comes to guilt and feeling guilty, you still might remember this terrible movie, uh, Jud Süß by, by uh, Veit Harlan, which was a propagandist uh, movie. Uh, uh, Jud Süß Oppenheimer was a real person, but in the movie they, he, they would turn him into a monster, and they would attribute everything bad you can imagine because he was Jewish. So he would, you know, everything what you can imagine is bad was contributed to this uh, Jutsus Oppenheimer. And the son, the son of uh, Veit Harlan, Thomas Harlan, he never ever got over that. And he would always, day and night, had these nightmares because thinking and knowing and realizing this is my father who did that movie. And the father survived the war and he would still would do movies would still work, and he tried to whitewash a little bit what he did during the Nazi time. And the, the terrible thing is, Veit Harlan was a very, very good director. Like Riefenstahl, he was a very, very good director, but they did terrible things. They used their knowledge for terrible things. And the other guy was, uh, was Ferdinand von Schirach, who was the, the uh, head of head of youth in the Nazi Reich, the, the highest ranking Nazi official who um, was responsible for the young people. And his uh, son, Ferdinand von Schirach, would always, always, would always write things around, around this fact that his father was a Nazi, the very high ranking one. And, but both, both uh, Thomas, Thomas Harlan would, at the end of his life, write something on his father trying and trying to take the guilt on himself, Thomas, away from his father. And this was a big discussion in Germany about this. And, uh, you can, and therefore, I'm, I'm really uh, pleased that I have the opportunity to, to witness what we are going to hear today. And I wish you all the best. And to me, I'm really glad that we are back, back here as real people and we are not doing the virtual thing. I don't know. We might have in winter. It might be more difficult, but please, this is really something that I'm, I'm really glad. And thank you for the Holocaust Museum. I'm, I'm especially greeting the survivors. I know how it is. Thank you. So wonderful. We can get started. Thank you so much, um, Consul General. It's so. I think wonderful to have you frame the program. And as you said. We are not responsible for what's happened previously in the past, but I do think what's important is that we're responsible for where we go into the future. And that's something that hopefully we'll learn a little bit more about today. So, um, Dr. Frank, I'll begin with you. You can drop the dot. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, when did you first learn about the Holocaust? Was it in school? Was it from your family? And did you see your family experience mirrored in the community around you? Were there other kids in your class who had similar experiences within their family? So I grew up in a house, half of a house, um, with lots of books. And there were hundreds of books about the Holocaust. And there was um, the famous book also by um, uh, Deutsche Korn, I've forgotten the first name. I, I wore the yellow star. I think it's called slightly different in, in English. Um, and I went through even when I was very small, I think around seven or eight, it's not quite so small, but smallish, um, I looked at all these books and I knew there was some connection with my family, but I didn't really get it at that age. But later it was my father who quite early on, um, so to say, inducted me and, and, and told me stories about his father and also told me about 
helped me try and visualize it. So what he always would do is he would say, imagine a truck pulls up on the other side of the road and he takes the people whose house in whose house we were living, we were renting it from them, and he takes them away. What are you going to do? And you stand there as an eight-year-old and sort of think, oh, I don't know. It, it seems it seems an evil thing to do, um, but it, it made some. It made me realize some of those what had happened at that time. And then he also said, imagine you've been with me and your mother in a um, carriage for two weeks, and now you arrive at the ramp of Auschwitz. And that means I, I, I think by that time I was, must have already been 11 or 12 because I had a vision of what that what that looked like. And then there's Mengele standing there and taking a whip and moving one to your right, one to the left, and you know you're never ever going to see your parents again. And if you, and I've, I use this sometimes, um, also with, with, with friends and, and other people who might try to talk to and say, imagine it just for one second with your own family, just for one second, and then you get a tiny, tiny glimpse, of course only a tiny, tiny glimpse of, of, of what it um, was like. So I was surrounded by it. Um, to that extent, my father then ended up writing numerous books, so he was already preparing at that time about books, and at all family reunions there were lots of conversations about my, my grandfather. Um, most most of my family is is actually very defi defending of my um, grandfather. So it was only my father who had a very clear position of saying, "Well, there's evil. You don't really. It's not very difficult to realize that was an evil person." Um, but the rest of the family was more mellow. At school, it wasn't really much of a topic. So we we we, we watched Anna Frank. We watched The White Rose. We read about it. Um, but I could sense a sort of reluctance amongst many of my people at that age to really enter into it emotionally um, and I know so that was the time also then when Holocaust was shown I don't think many people watched it at that time so I had to start the discussions only later when once I grew up a bit more and when I came when I came over to England then of course the discussion was huge because I was very German like um, Stefan said you're suddenly identified as being much more German than you initially feel so it was really your father who first told you about the Holocaust and told you about the experience of Jewish people during the Holocaust, and that was your, your introduction. But you were surrounded by books in your home, and were those your father's books? No, he only started writing his first book in 84, 84, 85. No, it was all the books, all the, all the books about the Holocaust, all the youth stories, all the memoirs, all the um, descriptions of, of concentration camps. So there was uh, lots of death around. And just for the audience's um, background, you mentioned the Holocaust, this miniseries, and that was really the first time in American culture where the social conscious was open to hearing about the Holocaust. It was this miniseries in the 70s, Meryl Streep was in it, and it was really the beginning of people learning about the Holocaust through their televisions. And so that was something that you sort of remember people not really watching in Germany at the time. Exactly. Actually, my mother also didn't watch it. My father was away a lot of that time. And I, in retrospect, I ever so often challenged my mother then why she didn't watch this. I mean, her husband writing book after book against his evil um, for, for, uh, or against his evil father, and my mother more or less refusing to watch it. And she said it was too painful. And I actually think there's a duty to endure that sort of pain. I think there's no option not to watch it. So with my big daughter, um, I've already watched it, and the other two children are going to watch it most likely this year. And of course, we'll cry again and feel awful, but there is a duty to do it. And I think that duty is not necessarily passed on to many others at the moment. Yeah. And so, Beth, your grandparents were Holocaust survivors. and. When did you first learn about the Holocaust? Was it in the same way with books in your home? Was it your parents talking to you about it? Was it in school? Did you see other kids in your community, in your town, who had similar experiences? So, I like to put it this way. Um, I feel like there was never a time where I did not know about the Holocaust. Um, because for me, my grandmother had a tattoo on her arm um, my grandparents had thick Polish accents and all of their friends and so there was always this sense that they didn't quite, they were looked at as outsiders in the community. Um, and then I vividly remember, you know, being a young girl and around Yom Kippur, you know, candles for us were um, during birthdays and, you know, that was something, you know, to celebrate. 
but during Yom Kippur, there was always this tray at my grandparents' house filled with lots of candles, and I never really understood what that meant. And I remember um, hearing the word Auschwitz a lot. So as a little girl, I didn't really know what the Holocaust was, but I knew something bad had happened to my family. I knew that family, many family members, including my great-grandparents, great aunts and uncles had all been killed in Auschwitz and I knew my grandmother peeled potatoes in a concentration camp but I didn't really understand the meaning behind that until I got older um, but I definitely knew that you know there was something bad and after listening to Francesca tell her story it's so interesting to me because we're exactly the same age so now I'm realizing that we live these parallel lives she being in Germany and learning from a young age, um, and I, I find that so admirable that what your father did, um, and I also learned at a young age, and you know, re being able to connect like this and have a conversation is something I'd never imagined in a million years would happen. And do you, were you learning about it in school at all? Or when did it sort of click for you that this was the experience of your grandparents? I think I definitely learned it way before school. So my, I spent a lot, I was very close with my grandparents. We would go to their homes for a Shabbat dinner and many of their friends were also Holocaust survivors. And so I think I was probably less than 10 years old when, when I got the big picture of what, um, what the Holocaust was. And um, I, I just remember, you know, my grandparents going in and out of English and Yiddish and Polish and speaking, you know, because they only wanted, I, I could piece, I had to piece together a lot of information. Um, but I really learned, um, everything about the Holocaust, you know, before I got to school, before I was educated, before reading, you know, Number of the Stars and all, all of the books that they gave you in school. Um, but it was really just hearing my grandparents' personal stories, and it was mostly from my grandmother, and stories about, um, you know, uh, leaving home in the middle of the night. Her, she had a younger sister, and right before the uh, the Nazis marched into uh, Poland in September of 1939. Her older sister came to her house to get her because she knew that she would be better off doing slave labor right across the border in Germany. And so her older sister saved her life by bringing her with her, even though she felt guilty about leaving her parents with her four younger siblings. But that did save her life because the minute the Nazis marched into Poland, the whole family was forced to move to the ghetto, and then they all died in Auschwitz. So that saved her life. So I heard stories like that growing up. So for both of you, it was really in your homes, in your families, before you were introduced to it in society or in school. And so growing up, um, obviously you didn't get a chance to know your grandfather, and how did you understand your father's role? You mentioned a little bit that his siblings were more defensive about your grandfather's role during the Holocaust. When was it obvious or clear to you that your father was saying something different? Oh, I think from very, very early on, he was always so critical about his, his father and um, speaking derogatively, but in, a, in, a, in, a, in an intelligent way, not just saying he's a dumb person, but sort of also going into ready into that amazing realization that you can have someone who's cultured, um, loved music, loved literature, loved chess, he invited great chess players to um, Krakow, was really a cultured person, becomes so evil. And he let me also, he, he allowed me 
um, lots of insights when he was researching for his first book and, and possibly for the audience. So my father's written a number of, of books against his family. Um, and they were considered in Germany as a sort of a breaking of a taboo. So when the first one was published, it's, it's very sexually and um, also very brutally written, but very clear. So he says, I'm trying to find something good in you, father. Can I find it? And he goes on this 200 page long journey and he doesn't find anything um, good. And he writes it with full of aggression. Um, and he, he, he shared with me some of, some of the stories along the way. How could someone um, go so quickly and sell their soul? And at the same time, definitely not wanting to end up at the gallows. I think my grandfather had no intention of dying, or actually no intention also of being evil. But th that road, that every single step you take, you become Hitler's personal lawyer. Well, sounds like a good job initially. But already then, as a cultured person, he could have known that this is not where you want to be. And he had a number of chances to get out, to leave, and he never took it. Um, I think I meandered away from your question, sorry. No, it, not at all. Um, how has the relationship been between your father and his siblings when it comes to the family legacy? So there are two sides to it. So on the one hand, when my father published the book, it was pre-published at, at a German weekly newspaper, The Stern. And um, two of the siblings wrote letters to the stand that were published saying, this is not a proper son. Um, he is the fremdi, the outsider he always was. Um, so really writing letters to the public disowning um, their brother. At the same time, we had really great, funny family meetings. And they stayed the same. They kept off the topic. So my, my one uncle was actually an Auschwitz denier. He kept on with all these things. Oh, you couldn't have, and the cyclone B wouldn't have been enough, and whatever. He actually said that. And they, there was then there was always a rise and a fight amongst the adults. Um, and then it was allowed to to rest. And the oldest um, brother of my father, he, I think he was 12 years old, 16 years older, he in the end said to my father, I hated your book, but I'm very grateful that you wrote it. So some things did change over, over the years, um, but the reception within the family was, was tendentially negative, and even now, quite a lot of people say, my father broke that taboo. You have to love your parents. And I have told my children that if I do something really evil, they're also not allowed, they're allowed not to love me. And they're nodding their heads back there. <laughs> and I think it's important for parents to know that you are rightfully disowned if you behave like my grandfather did. You said the adults, sort of putting yourself separate from that generation, and I'm wondering how do you think you access the information differently than your father did? Because your father was very outspoken about his father, and you've been outspoken about the crimes of your grandfather, but what, being the granddaughter and not the child, what, what do you think the time and the distance has afforded you? So on the one hand, a certain freedom of choice. So I, I only started making the story part of also my my professional life in the last few years. So I wasn't always confronted with it and with the surname Frank. I mean, I was asked, am I related to Anna Frank? And you have to say, no, the opposite. So it's, um, there is no, you don't have to out yourself in any way. Um, so that's on the one hand the distance. On the other hand, there's this, I was saying how my father started very early on about talking about his grandfather. And there's a psychologist whom we as a family have gone to for years as a family coach. And she actually stopped me from telling my children early on about the grandfather. Um, I'd started when they were, I think, six, four, and two or something. And she said, no, no, stop it. You have to be very careful, because if you believe you are descended from shit, you become shit. Um, and so in retrospect, I think my father started a bit too early with it, because it's, it's, it seemed so so bleakly awful. And then I watched any films, and I went to boarding school in the UK, and I was allowed to watch the um, siblings Oppen Oppenheimer at night. I was allowed to watch other things and read other things. And I, I took it upon myself to a certain extent. It wasn't that far away from self-hatred for some time. So, and I think that my father never had. Um, so he had a, because he grew up not knowing, then from the age of about four or five, realizing he was part of an evil construct. But somehow he managed to divorce himself possibly a bit more than I managed to do initially. I think it's, 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 it's okay now, but yeah. And Beth, similarly, I know that your mother was born in Europe right after the war, and you were very, very close with your parents, but how do you think having the distance as the granddaughter allowed you to access this information in a different way than your mother did? 
I think, so my mother's experience, she only spoke German when she first came to the United States, and she just wanted to fit in. So she was so focused on becoming assimilated, and she just wanted to be an American girl. And so she knew her family situation, but really rebelled. She knew her parents acted a certain way and didn't blame them for the way they acted, uh, but she knew that she just wanted to be an American girl and wanted um, you know, to blend in and fit in. So my grandparents didn't really share their personal stories with my mother and my uncle. Um, and it wasn't until my sister and I came along that this separation, you know, we weren't living in the same home. And so my grandmother, I think, felt this safe space where she could share these stories that were probably, you know, uh, just um, bottled inside of her for so many years, the trauma that she was carrying along, this baggage that she had been carrying along with her. And one thing that I did forget to mention in the, your previous question is my sister and I had sleepovers a lot at my grandparents' house, and my grandmother had nightmares at night. And that was another, she screamed, and I would share a bed with her. And I, I just remember always trying to stay close, tight. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, it did make a huge difference because my mom just wanted to be normal and American and then my sister and I came along and, you know, it was an, a chance for my grandmother to get a, a lot of the trauma, I think, off her chest. But also, she wanted us to really understand, um, you know, something she always used to say to me is, she would tell a story and then remind us, you can, you can never get too complacent. And, you know, we were kids, even, in my early adult years, I didn't even understand what that meant. Now I do, of course, <laughs> but it's a good lesson. So neither of you graduated college and went into this field. Um, neither of you went to school at 1718 and said, I want to work in Holocaust commemoration and education. And Beth, I know that you began in the finance sector. Do you think that your grandparents experiences impacted you then in your career choice? I don't think so. I think that my grandparents were so proud to be able to, I mean, for them to have children and grandchildren and to see them succeed, I'm not supposed to be here. My kids aren't supposed to be here, right? That is the biggest form of revenge. and. For them to see, you know, their grandchild attend an Ivy League university and then get a job on Wall Street, I mean, <laughs> imagine. So, um, but they, you know, I just remember always making them proud. And, you know, when you're young, you don't really appreciate that and you don't really understand where it comes from. But now in my older years, I, I appreciate that. And I think that though, when I moved to Los Angeles, my husband's a filmmaker, so I moved here um, for love for him. He's sitting right there. <laughs> and um, I didn't realize how important my grandparents were to me and my connection to the Holocaust until I moved to Los Angeles and that was missing from my life. So I must have subconsciously made choices in my life not realizing it because when I came here, I really did feel this huge void you know, not being around survivors, not hearing their accents, not hearing the stories, um, you know, that, that was something that I, I really missed when I moved here. So I, I believe that I probably made choices along the way, subconsciously, um, you know, without thinking about it. And what has the career shift been like for you to go from working in the finance sector to being the CEO of a Holocaust museum where you are ensuring that every single day someone is learning from this history. So I think, so part, part of how I got here, part of my journey to this job was because I felt this void in my life, I joined the board of the museum. And that was actually because my husband was doing research for his film and he was at the museum every day and he would come home and say to me, you know, you really need to go to the museum, your people are there. 
And since I was his wife, it, it took me a long time to listen to him. <laughs> and so I finally listened and I showed up and, and I met the survivors and heard their thick Polish accents, realized this is a place I need to be a part of. So I like to say I, I showed up and, and I never left. And I joined the board and got really involved. And, and when this building opened, I, I did the docent training class um, with Jordana, and I realized that I knew the Holocaust through my own lens from hearing my grandparents' stories my whole life. And, and I am very lucky because I was 40 years old when they died, so I really I, I had a very close relationship with them. Um, even my children, who are you know fourth generation survivors, got to know them pretty well. Um, but it wasn't until I became the CEO of the museum and started giving tours to students and visitors and sharing my grandparents' story with the history, but providing that personal story that goes along you know, with it, um, that was, has been so impactful. So to be able to share their story and see how other people react to it and, and see how they interact with their personal stories, that is something I could never have imagined. And, you know, it's gratifying. <laughs> and to think that, I mean, as I f carry this um, sense of responsibility um, very seriously, you know, to safeguard their story and, and the truth. And so, uh, you know, I feel so grateful and lucky that, that I get to do that um, every day as the leader of this museum. So we heard a little bit about how Beth, in a way, fell into this career change. Thank you, John, for bringing her here. Um, what was your transition from um, you know, not having a career related to the Holocaust and then transitioning, in a way, to become so outspoken about learning from the past and to educate future generations? I'll answer in a second, yeah. no, but first, and I'm using the finger my father always has, I'll answer in a second, but because when you said the revenge is the living, it reminds me of a story that my father um, experienced when he was in, in Krakow, and um, he met a number of survivors, and one told the story how he'd gone into um, the most famous restaurant in Krakow, and he said, which is the table where Hans Frank always used to sit? And then the waiter said, okay, over there, and then he s sat down and ate, and then he said, the big Hans Frank has been hanged, and the little Jew from Katowice has survived. And I think that is so great. That is such a story which really opens opens yeah, your heart and makes you so happy that people have have, have survived. Um, um, well, I, I suppose with me, it's it's so. I've, I first studied law, which had nothing. Well, no, I first studied read history in Cambridge, and then I came back and studied law, which has less, I think, to do with my grandfather more than my mother was also a, a judge. Um, and then I transitioned into trying to get closer to people making decisions. So first companies making decisions, so I became a management consultant, um, and then into people making decisions, individual managers. So I've gone into executive education and I work for um, a business school in Berlin. And what I started doing then was teaching a lot about change and also about influencing and how we influence ourselves and how we influence others. And it became clearer and clearer to me how, how my grandfather is, a, is a, a symbol of actually everything going wrong psychologically. You know, all the wrong steps you could take without noticing he did take. And, that there, and I want to write a book, I've written a number of books, but I want to write one about how to avoid becoming a war criminal and how to avoid being hanged, because I think there are so many lessons out of the wrong decisions he made. He allowed himself to be anchored by wealth. I want to earn a thousand marks a month. Brigitte, wouldn't that be great? Um, you can be the queen of Poland. Um, all these giving status, wanting money, wanting power, um, not comparing yourself with, with what you could be, but always comparing yourself to the other people you've started surrounding yourself with, and then saying, oh, they have better access to Hitler, and I want more of my own access. So he's become an epitome to me of, of, of failed decision-making, and also of someone who doesn't understand the bigger picture. Um, isn't isn't humble actually in any way towards what what he's been given. That's the one side. So I've started including some of it in 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 my teachings. The other perspective is though that I think there is a 
I keep on meeting people who don't want to talk about the war anymore, um, and they don't want to talk about the German role. And I, I find that um, just recently I was teaching in something called the Industrieclub Düsseldorf, and it's a very famous industrial club where Hitler actually delivered a speech in 1936 um, and got, got the industry onto his side. And it actually has a plaque rem um, remembering the, the death of the world, First World War and then remembering the death of the Second World War without a comment on the side, and we apologize hugely for all the crimes that we committed at that time. Nothing. And I posted that on um, on LinkedIn as a sort of as a being appalled by it. And I got so many not not I got some negative critics sort of who were saying why should we always chastise ourselves? Why should we always be negative about ourselves? So I think there's a big danger of people losing the connection. So so I'm, I'm, I'm doing both. So on the one hand, I'm still just teaching and also wanting to earn money. And at the other time, I have the um, the, um, the growing passion that that if you understand the mind of one criminal, it helps you understand where, where there's the road to evil. And I've seen myself sometimes slide down it, and hopefully up to now have stepped back. But I've seen others slide down it. Um, yeah, so that's why I've started including him. And you mentioned that there is this, so you've heard from people in Germany who are saying maybe we should talk less about this, let's move on. I mean, we're nearing nearly a hundred years since Hitler came to power in 1933. I mean, we're at about 90 years. We have another decade to 100. But where do you think or where do you see the next generation taking this? And you yourself are a parent. You mentioned that you have kids. Where do you hope the next generation takes this? And what important lessons, I guess the question is twofold, because as we mentioned earlier, your grandfather was held responsible for crimes against humanity in Nuremberg and was um, received the death sentence for that. So where do you see the next generation going? And why do you think it's so important to study this moment in history for the next generation? So I hope they continue taking the responsibility for it, and I, I, th I think I see with, with my children that they are, and, and their friends that there is a willingness to do that. Um, on the other hand, I think not on the other hand, and in addition, I think there is the responsibility to understand where the educational lines are. So of course we have no, we are not guilty of the crimes, but just being in, in the US, it's just, I was saying that early on um, to someone, it's just so amazing how friendly the drivers are here. <laughs> um, and I'm going to go back to Germany and people are going to honk their horns at me because I'm going to drive in a non-German ma manner for a number of, of days and I may be kinder and more open and friendlier. And there is something in the German, not psyche, but in the German culture, the way we've we've moved from, I suppose, the 1870s, uh, 1870s down um, over via the Holocaust into now, where we have some educational behaviors, or no, some behaviors that have been educated into us that are still dangerous. Um, and my father keeps on writing books against the Germans and his family. Um, we've got parties like the AFD who try and make everything minute and uh, small, and, uh, as if we're not criminal. And we have this this happiness of judging others. The Germans are hugely judgmental, and we are so unprepared. Of course, I'm being generic, and there are some nice Germans and whatever. Um, but we have this tendency to be so over. We love to regulate things. We love to be very straight and strict, and we have a tendency to lose our heart. I mean, my children say that I become so friendly when I drink alcohol. <laughs> um, and there may be, I, I, I hope I can also be friendly without it, but there is something about us opening up um, and, and being vulnerable. And I think we haven't yet learned it. And, it, and there is therefore the danger that we may behave evilly again because we haven't really changed in that vein. And so I think the thing is to take on the responsibility. I think the next generation is is willing to do so. And I think the, the greatness is the immigration that's happening in Germany. There's so much changing. So uh, cultures can change. It's just they take decades and, and centuries. So I think there is a hope for us yet. And Beth, you also mentioned that you're a parent, and I wonder how, what hope do you see for your kids for the next generation? Or what legacies do you hope to impart on them? Why do you think it's important for them to learn about the Holocaust? You said that they had a very close relationship with your grandparents, but why do you think that it's important for their generation to continue learning about it? So I want to go back to Francesca. You know, she had, her father made a choice. Francesca has made a choice and, um, you know, to publicly condemn what her grandfather 
has done. And I feel like, you know, that's something that's important to me too, to pass down to my children is, you know, we have a choice to speak out and um, not just, you know, continue sharing their own family history, but, you know, this is something that we teach at the museum um, and, you know, education is a big part of this. We, we want all of the visitors who come here, when they leave, to feel this sense of responsibility when they're out in the world, um, you know, to be an upstander, to speak out. Um, we can't be quiet anymore. I mean, the, my biggest fear is, you know, in the museum, the second gallery that talks about the rise of Nazism and that chipping away of people's rights, you know, that's something that I heard my whole life from my grandparents, um, the slippery slope. And so we all need to remain very vigilant and take a role. We, we have a shared responsibility in this. So yes, the museum, places like our institution, um, plays an important part in the society in, in terms of education and making sure it continues to be part of the school curriculum. We need to make sure the entire country uh, mandates Holocaust education as part of uh, the curriculum, um, but we all have a shared responsibility um, to be vigilant, to speak out, to do things you know um, that are right, and we, um, you know, we're at this time right now, pivotal time where, you know, we're soon we'll be living in a post-survivor world. So how do we teach this history? And um, how do we continue to carry on survivors' voices and you know make sure that history does not keep repeating itself? And um, you know we're I'm so proud of the work that we're doing as uh, you know with our small staff. It's pretty it's amazing, but we can always do more because we know education is the greatest catalyst for change. But we need to make sure that um, we can amplify the work that we're doing and that everyone plays a role in this and everyone needs to know that they can play a role in this. Has there been anything surprising since you started becoming, since you first became a docent at the museum and you were on the board and you were more in involved in Holocaust education, was there ever a moment that surprised you or reminded you of something about your grandparents' stories that you had forgotten about for a while? Well, there, there is one story that comes to mind is, um, so I, I always say that, um, tell people my grandmother peeled potatoes in, um, in Ravensbrück. And so when the museum first opened, we had a potato peeler uh, on loan from the Auschwitz-Birkenau Museum. And so, like for me, growing up in New York, and I always thought of myself as the quintessential New Yorker, and then here I am in Los Angeles, and I'm disconnected from the survivor community, but being part of the museum changed that for me. And here I am, the museum had just opened, and I see this potato peeler. Granted, my grandmother did not use a proper potato peeler. She used a knife. <laughs> um, but Mary Bauer was a survivor in our community who also was in Ravensbrook, and I showed her the potato peeler, and I said, oh, Mary, look, my grandmother peeled potatoes in Ravensbrook. And Mary looked at me and said, your grandmother saved my life. and and. And I looked at her kind of confused, like, what do you mean? And she said, well, I remember the girls in the kitchen peeling potatoes. They would toss the skins across the floor and I'd walk in, bend down, pick them up and, and walk away. And the skins is what kept me alive. And my grandmother used to say that to me. The Nazis were so stupid, they didn't know the skins had all the nutrients. And I would sneak them and bring them back to the barracks to my sister and toss them across the floor when other prisoners came. And, and it wasn't until that moment when Mary shared that story that that was such a huge act of defiance, what my grandmother had done. And it was so brave because she could have been shot if she was caught. Mary was saying she could have been shot if she was caught bending over to pick it up. And so it's moments like that and just hearing other survivors' stories as well and how, for example, my grandfather he, right before the Russians liberated his labor camp, he broke his back. He was in the infirmary. He was working on the railroad, broke his back. He couldn't walk. He was laying flat on his back in the infirmary. 
and the Nazis were taking all the prisoners to leave on the death march. And a Nazi came over to him, pointed a gun to his forehead, and was about to kill him. And then he said to my grandfather, I don't want to waste a bullet on you. You're going to die from the landmines. And, and then he walked away. Well, the landmines never went off. So the Russians liberated my grandfather. And I find out later on from survivors in our community here, many of whom were in labor camps working on those landmines, who deliberately, another act of defiance, did not wire these landmines correctly. And it's all, it's just interesting to me how these stories I heard growing up now come back full circle or are making a lot more sense to me. Um, but uh, so here, being able to hear those stories um, and having that personal connection and being able to, to share it with people. And, and that sends such a strong message that even, you know, like in our rescue and resistance gallery, the diplomats who defied their countries, knowing that they could also, you know, um, be killed and, and, and many of them were, um, or ordinary people who just, you know, um, saved one life. Um, you know, the, these are things, these are important lessons that, you know, we all need to share with people. And why do you think it's important to have conversations like today? To have a conversation with the granddaughter of a, of a Nazi who might have been responsible for some of your family being killed? What do you hope comes from conversations like this? And why do you think it's so critical for us to join with people from different countries, different backgrounds, different communities to have conversations? I think it is so important to be able to talk about uncomfortable things and to bring people together from different communities. You know, Building Bridges, that's actually a program that we started during the pandemic right after the death of George Floyd when there was all this social unrest going on across the country. And we realized that it's so important to create a safe space where we can have these types of conversations, bring people together who don't normally who don't have things in common or they don't think they have things in common when really they have a lot in common and um, have a civil discourse. And people need to be more tolerant and open up and we need to encourage people to have a dialogue. I mean, I, I wonder what, what would my grandparents think right now that we're sitting right next to each other? But I do, I mean, we have some survivors here in, in the audience and you know, I think Francesca says the only connection she has to her grandfather is a biological one, right? And here she is taking time out of her uh, holiday <laughs> vacation to do this important program with her wonderful children who are here in, in the audience. And so I, I think my grandparents would be very supportive and, you know, happy about that because this is the future. I mean, in order to, you know, build a future without hate. We need to come together and, and have these conversations. And my, grand, my grandfather is looking up from hell and saying, oh, I lost. <laughs> <laughs> but a similar question, you know, why do you think it's so important to come and sit on a panel? I mean, my grandfather was born in a part of Poland that became the general government. Why do you think it is important to be confronted with a room full of people who might have a lot of pain or a lot of anger or a lot of trauma, why do you think it's important to have conversations like this, even though you're on holiday trying to enjoy the, the sun of Los Angeles? Yeah, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a clear duty, I think, of us as humans to, to expose ourselves. And, and particularly if you've got anything, not even particularly, everyone. I think everyone has a duty to expose themselves to the history of, for which they are responsible, um, in a way. Anything else makes us stupid and narrow-minded and more likely to do something evil. And I think you, you have to open people's minds. So what I find interesting in Germany now, there's um, so many new immigrants who, who no, how to phrase this. So because of quite a lot of Muslim immigrants from other countries, there's a new anti-Semitism that is rising. But when you come to talk to some people, and it, it becomes very clear that it's important how to deal with 
being hated and the racism issue hits everyone the same. So it doesn't really matter if, if, if you're Jewish or if you're Muslim at the moment, all over the world, there will be some people who hate you. So you have to sit down together. And the same with the Germans. There are some people, when my boarding school, there were some people who hated me. But um, for being for being German, but of course their their, their partners had been killed, and, and it wasn't for me to then say, oh, I poor little Francesca, I'm being hated. It was important to sort of look at that and and see the yeah, see the bigger picture once again. So I think it's it's so important to share and sit down. And um, my father most likely is going to read at the school of of my son, and my son has lots of immigrants in his class, and many don't know much about the Holocaust, um, but they will be hugely interested in what does the child of a perpetrator think and how can you deal with war criminals and is there something the Nuremberg trial for the people um, who evicted them from their country so I think you have to broaden the conversation um, in, in many ways but then on the other hand by broaden it when you've got this no you have to broaden the lessons learned you don't have to broaden the conversation the examples are so so horrifically present and anything which is vivid to our mind. I mean, going through going through the museum early on, and I was, was briefly speaking to my children, it's the individual stories that kick you every time. Um, and that's why you have to share them. And yeah, that's why you have to share them. Thank you. I want to give a few minutes um, for some questions from the audience. We have some time and we have a question. I'm going to come to you with the microphone. You must be extremely proud of your father. And what do you think it was that made him view your grandfather differently and what had happened during the Holocaust as being something really bad, whereas his siblings didn't necessarily feel that way? So my father, I think, had two key experiences which, which helped him on that. On the one hand, it was that his father actually believed he may be the son of a lover of my grandmother and not his son. So um, he remembers being chased around a table in Krakow, in the Krakow castle, the Wawel, by his father saying, you are the Fremdi, 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 you are the outsider of the family. And he just wanted to be taken in the arms of his father. So um, I think we can be very happy that his father didn't take him up in his arms because then he may have also become drawn into the family. Um, the second experience was when he was at, at Schlierse, a lake outside of Munich where they lived, and uh, American soldiers came after they'd arrested uh, the grandfather, and they also came to, because it was clear that was the house of the minister. And they lined up my grandmother and the other, uh, the five children against the wall, and it, it, there was a moment where it could have happened that they were shot, because close to Schlierse is also Dachau, so people had seen um, what, had, what had happened. And, um, and then my grandmother shouted at the soldier, and then they, 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 they survived. But my father got the feeling at that moment, he said, I felt the soldier was right. I was on the evil side, sort of. My, my family was the evil side. And I think that really helped him um, to, to have that view from above. And then whenever he said, he says that whenever he has a feeling, well, why can't I love my parents and there was something positive possibly after all, and of course there's something positive even in, in the worst criminal. And then he says, then whenever that comes to me, I just think of the mountains of corpses. I just have to think of that, the picture of the mountain of corpses, and all becomes irrelevant. My potential love to my parents, my potential whatever. I have a duty due to these piles of corpses. Yeah, so I think those are the three key points. Thank you so much, both of you, really just incredible. My question is for Dr. Frank. Um, what is it like for the other grandsons and daughters, your cousins, and I'm wondering if they were influenced by their parents' position? Yes, they were strongly influenced. So there's one cousin who reads up a lot on it. So he's also, I think, very, very clear about the, the criminality of my grandfather. The one cousin has just decided not to think about it anymore. Two, or actually three or four of the cousins have decided not to think about it. Um, and the other one is actually still defending um, my grandfather. So they were, they were strongly influenced. Um, but to be honest, all of the five siblings um, in Germany would say they had something had was an waffle. They all were psychologically unsound. Um, I think they all. It, it, I, I suppose it, there is a, a a certain damnation if you have parents like that who then get hanged. 
there is something that doesn't go well with the human psyche. And uh, my father just, my mother just died a few months ago, and my father's also examining himself in his um, relationships. And I think he also wasn't psychologically sound. So he, it, it didn't matter that much in the relationship to me and to the wider world. But I think the other, they were all, they should have gone to a psychologist very, very early on. Then I think they could have got out of it and taught their children proper things. And I guess a similar question, um, Beth, are your cousins or siblings as committed to Holocaust memory as you are? And why do you think you sort of carry the torch? That is an interesting question. Not really. There, I really, I do have, so I have family in Mexico City. That was another thing in, early on in my childhood I thought was strange is why we have so many family members in Mexico City. And then I learned that that was because in the mid-1930s, my grandfather's cousins, who he was very close to, saw what was happening and decided to leave Poland and they weren't let into the United States, so they ended up in Mexico City, and my family is still there to this day. And so the, in addition to me, there's another family member who has become our, you know, the family historian. And he, so he's also a third generation. He's a little bit younger than me. And he recently came across a treasure trove of, of photographs that his grandparents must have taken with them when they left Poland. And because they lived right next door to my grandparents and my grandfather, actually, my grandfather's family, there were a bunch of photos of my grandfather from when he was a child. My grandfather was born in 1923, and only a couple of months ago, uh, my cousin in Mexico City found this photo of my grandfather um, who looked like he was eight or nine years old. And when my grandparents were alive, we had never seen any photos of them as children, any photos of their own family members, their parents. You know, there was nothing because when they went back to Poland after the war, all of their things were taken and, um, you know, they brought nothing with them to the United States. So to be able to all of a sudden see photos of, you know, my grandfather. Um, you know, that, that is just something unbelievable. But um, so my cousin has taken on this role and this interest in trying to, you know, piece together some additional information. Um, but I am the only one in my family right now. I think it'll be interesting to see what kind of role my kids play. Mm -hmm. I know that, um, you know, they, they do take this, you know, very seriously. Um, but they're still young, they're 21 and 23. But, um, but right now, I'm pretty much the only one in my family. <laughs> for the audience, I'm sorry. I want to make sure everyone heard it. So the question is about um, Hans's widow and it, what your relationship was like with your grandmother and what her perspective was on her husband and her experience during the Holocaust. So my grandmother died when my father was 20 years old, so on his 20th birthday, so in 1959, so I never met her. Um, the, she, uh, she, she loved, I suppose she was, narcissistic, egocentric in the sense that she loved going to the ghetto and bargaining, never did anything good. She loved furs, she loved being the center of attention, she didn't care much for her children, didn't spend much time with them. Um, and after the war, at least in the eyes of my father, she to a certain extent expiated some of her sins because she had to take care of the five children. And to do that, she worked incredibly hard at selling an awful book that my grandfather had written in prison called In the um, Sight of the Gallows. She got up every morning at four or five o'clock and sat down and wrote lots of letters on the typewriter 
to get this book sold, weirdly enough, to monasteries um, a lot and to individuals who then paid a donation. And it seems there were some monasteries after the Second World War where during lunch the monks got read my grandfather's book to. It's really very tasteless, uh, very bad. So she spent a lot of time trying to get her children, um, but getting food into their mouths. Um, so her take, I think she was very happy about the riches she had. She had consciously chosen to stay married to my grandfather. My grandfather had wanted a divorce because he'd gone back to his old um, child love. And then my grandmother started a fight about this, and then Hitler actually said, no divorce until after the war. <laughs> um, and uh, she said, I'd rather be the widow of a minister than the divorced, um, the divorced wife. I think she never really reflected much on her role. Then my father just published something about the last letters um, they'd written to each other. They don't talk about evil or crimes or whatever. They don't say, sorry, I wish I'd reacted differently. I think she lived in the here and now and felt life was a bit harder now than it was beforehand. I think she was sadly unreflective. Um, yeah. Okay, one last question. Any of your aunts or uncles ever speak with your grandfather? Were any of them old enough before he had passed away or before? It was executed. Yes, quite a lot of them spoke spoke with him, but my father is so angry just recently, he said, why did I not interview them more properly? So he started writing the book when he was about 40, I think. Um, could be about, yeah, around 40. And he said they were they were all alive. Aunt Elsa, Aunt Markle, Aunt, they were all alive. And he didn't ask all the questions, so he's furious at it. So he, he spoke to them, but not for the really important things. But nevertheless, he unearthed a lot of documents and he interviewed lots of people, but yeah. But he didn't get in, in in his view. He didn't get enough detail. So I know we both talked a little bit today about the um, the retribution or the the fight to show that we're here. Beth, you said you weren't supposed to be here, and you're here. And you showed the survivor sitting in the restaurant saying, "Hans is dead, and I'm here." And I think one important thing that I hope we all leave with today is considering why we're here and what our intentions are. We're actually seated in the Children's Memorial at Holocaust Museum LA, and this is dedicated to the one and a half million ch Jewish children who were murdered in the Holocaust. So just thinking about one child's life who was not able to be here, who was not able to live out their life, and the fact that you are here today and making this choice, and what can we do in honor of those who are not here? What can we do as sort of a fight back to, to what happened during the Holocaust. And I think that's one important lesson that we heard today amongst so much. And I want to thank both of you for sharing about your family stories, um, as traumatic and as difficult as they are. And I really do think that conversations like this can lead to a more united front. It, you know, We are not responsible for the crimes and experiences of our parents and our grandparents. We are responsible for our actions and considering how to make these choices. Um, as you mentioned. So thank you so much and thank you to the audience for coming today. Thank you everyone.